Good evening. My name is Mark Syme, the minister at the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our evening services for Sunday, March the 10th. Per usual, we will sing songs of praise, observe the Lord's Supper, and I have a message that I hope will be beneficial to each one of us. We sing here at Northfield from Songs of Faith and Praise. Uh, if you do not have that book and wish to sing along, I will make sure to give you the title of the song along with the number so that you can either use your book or Google the song and sing with us. The first song that we will sing is number 202, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. 202, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. <clears throat> Joyful, joyful, we adore Thee, God of glory, God of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before Thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround thee, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around thee, center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and fountain, flowery meadow, flashing sea. Chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Well, spring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou art Father, Christ our brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Mortals join the mighty chorus, which the morning stars begin. Father, love is reigning o'er us, brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us sunward to the triumph song of life. Turn to number 183, Lord of all being, throne to far. 183, Lord of all being, throne to far. Lord of all being, throned afar, Thy glory flames from sun and star. 
center and soul of every sphere, yet to each loving heart how near. Son of our life, thy quickening ray sheds on our path the glow of day. Star of our hope, thy softened light cheers the long watches of the night. Our midnight is thy smile withdrawn, our noontide is thy gracious dawn, our rainbow watch thy mercy sign, all save the clouds of sin are thine. Before we partake of the Lord's Supper, we will sing number 366, 366, By Christ Redeemed. By Christ Redeemed, 366. By Christ redeemed and Christ restored, we keep the supper of the word and show the death of our dear Lord until he body given in our stand is seen in this memorial bread and as we drink we see the blood until he and thus that dark betrayal night with the last advent we unite by one bright chain of loving right until he time to observe the Lord's Supper. We do this because the scriptures tell us that uh, Christians gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread. That is found in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, while Paul and those with him were at Troas. Uh, we have come to understand that this is one of the very, very important aspects of our worship to the Lord. It is something that we are to do every first day of the week, every Lord's day. We are to gather about his table. Jesus instituted this Lord's Supper on the night in which he was betrayed, when he told the disciples to take bread and take the fruit of the vine. In the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul reiterates this and explains to us, the uh, breaking of bread and the drinking of the fruit of the vine to proclaim the Lord's death until it comes. So as we gather about the table, let's solemnly go back to uh, the hill of Calvary where Jesus died for our sins. Let's give thanks for the bread. Our God and Heavenly Father, we are just so grateful that Jesus was willing to come to earth and your divine wisdom. We understand that he came at just the right time. And we understand that he came to die for the sins of mankind. And so as we partake of this bread, help us to remember the body that was nailed to the cross, the agony that Jesus went through as a human for each one of us 
Bless us as we partake. Help us to make this an event that is so important to us that the death of Jesus Christ uh, is memorialized every first day of the week as we gather about the table. Be with us as we partake of this bread. We ask it in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. From a human standpoint, we know the importance of the blood that flows through our bodies. The blood that flows through our bodies uh, is what uh, allows us to literally live. It carries the nutrients, it carries the oxygen that we need so that we can take our next breath. And so as we think of the blood that Jesus shed, we understand that it was his life oozing out of his body. And so as we partake of the fruit of the vine, let's remember the blood that Jesus shed. Let's pray. We're just so grateful that Jesus was willing to shed his innocent blood. We have come to understand the significance of that blood, that it is the blood of our salvation that it is the blood that washes away our sins. And so as we partake, let's bring our sins to you and understand that through that blood, those sins can be washed away. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Having completed the Lord's Supper, uh, we do something else that we are instructed to do on the first day of the week. We are instructed to lay by and store that which we have prospered. There's not a set amount. Uh, there is no uh, minimum. There is no maximum. It says as we have prospered. And so as we give, let's truly remember how we have indeed prospered. Let's remember that uh, we give back to the Lord what is his, and we understand that Jesus died for the church, and the church is his kingdom here on earth. It is the vehicle through which others are brought to Christ. It is the vehicle through which uh, we can help others. Let's reflect on those thoughts as we give. Let's pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're just grateful at this time for the opportunity to give. We understand that God loves a cheerful giver. Let's be cheerful in our giving, knowing that what we give is the Lord's, but what we give is for a purpose, that the word of God might be spread, that um, we as a church can help those that are in need. Bless us in our giving. Help us to uh, understand that it is what we are supposed to do as Christians. And let us give with a, an open heart. Bless us as we give, we pray it in his most holy name. Amen. The last song that we will sing is number 589. 589. The name of the song is Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. Sometimes we name this song, What a Fellowship. <clears throat> Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, number 589. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus. 
Safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus. Safe and secure from all alarms, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning on Jesus, leaning on Jesus. Leaning on the everlasting arms. That concludes the song part of our service. I know the Lord was praised. I hope you were uplifted by singing praises to our Lord. I'm going to do a series of lessons over the next few Sunday evenings dealing with our life together. And by that, I mean the kingdom of God here on earth, the Lord's church. Uh, this morning's title, uh, under the heading of our life together, is a call to fellowship. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, the bar was set for each one of us. We have an account of what the early church did. It says in Acts 2, 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. They did all the important things that they were supposed to do. We just observed the Lord's Supper. We just gave back to the Lord. But there's one important aspect of that verse. It says not only did they continue in the teachings of the apostles, but they also fellowshipped. They also fellowshipped. And so as Christians, we're supposed to be uh, uh, steadfast in the word of the Lord. And we are supposed to break bread and we are supposed to pray. But you know what? As a church, we can't do that without fellowshipping together. And so there are some important aspects, I believe, to what fellowship is all about. And so we need to properly understand what fellowship is, what important facet of the Lord's church this is. And we need to ask ourselves this important question, are we practicing it in the way that's consistent with the example of the early church. Are we steadfastly involved in the word of God? Are we breaking bread? Are we praying? And I would maintain that we can only do that as we fellowship together. And so this is the first lesson in this series about our life together. And I would like us over the next few weeks to examine the subject of fellowship in the light of the scriptures and with uh, the objective in mind of ensuring a proper understanding and application of this biblical uh, subject 
we are going to delve into what fellowship is all about. And so first I would like us to uh, look at some of the things that I believe that we need to avoid if we are to fellowship together. One of those things is self-centeredness. And you know, I am not even hinting that this is the way our church is, but is something that we need to think about and something that we need to avoid. Let's do a suppose. Suppose someone who is a specialist in studying how groups work together came to our church and, you know, for a few weeks, just as a an observer and as an expert in this, and looked at us and compared us to other groups that might meet together. Now, what other groups meet together? Well, we, we may have clubs. We may have organizations. When uh, we had children when we were younger, we had the PTA, where people who were interested in their children met. And so these are organizations. And so we need to look at how we are in relationship to some other organizations. Let's look at some of the things that I think are very, very important to us as we fellowship together. First, how we relate to one another when we assemble in worship. I believe this to be an important aspect of fellowship. Two, how we interact with one another in our assemblies. I think this is really important. Our group loyalties, we need to be very, very careful of this. Our willingness to support one another in times of need. And finally, is the only place that we see fellow Christians at worship service? Is that it? Is it just when we formally gather together? Or are our fellow Christians our families? Indeed, our friends. And so, in looking at those, if a casual observer uh, came in, how would he observe us? How would we meet up with his expectations? Do they see people that are interested in each other's lives? That people are coming together for multi-purposes we, we come together uh, to worship, not only for the sake of our own spiritual life, but for our personal salvation. We can't go to church like we go to a movie. Right? It's not just this one-time event. We go to the movie, we sit in our seats, we buy our popcorn, we watch the movie, and we walk out, and that's it. We need to make sure within our church that we are not self-centered. Because when we go to a movie, it's just me and the movie. Or me and the person I'm with and the movie. There's nothing else. That's not the way the church is supposed to be. The church is uh, designed so that we can have a relationship with God and at the same time have a relationship with those that we worship with because we're all on the same journey. We're all on the same path. And so, let's face it, we go to a movie and there's no fellowship taking place. But when we go to church, there is supposed to be fellowship. And so what I would contend this evening that uh, a fellowship 
is free from self-centeredness. And the truth is emphasized in the scriptures. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 9, it tells us that we are to be hospitable to one another. We're to be hospitable to one another. When the uh, qualifications for elders and for deacons are given to us in uh, 2 Timothy and in Titus, one of those aspects, one of those qualifications is that an elder and a deacon are supposed to be hospitable. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 26 indicates to us that we are to have a genuine care for one another. Um, we know that Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24, that care for one another goes as far as to encourage one another to love and to good deeds. In James chapter 5, uh, we have two aspects of what our fellowship is supposed to be all about and show that it's free from any self-centeredness. One, in James chapter 5, verse 16, it lets us know that we are to pray for one another. It tells us what the power of prayer is, especially when the prayer comes from someone who is righteous in the Lord. And then, in James chapter 5, verses 19 to 20, it says within our fellowship, we are supposed to have an interest in restoring one another. There's more. In fellowship, according to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, we are to teach and admonish one another. How? Within the truth of God's word. We are to look out for the interests of one another. It tells us that we are supposed to have those interests in all people, but especially to those of the fellowship of faith. And with that, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, there comes service within the fellowship of the Lord to get away from self-centeredness. We are to serve one another. Now, in our Bibles, we have the first century church as our example. The truth was exemplified in the early church. We use that scripture from Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 42 uh, to 46, where uh, the church at Jerusalem emphasized the truth of the apostles' teachings. Now, they didn't only do that at Jerusalem. They did that in churches that met everywhere. We can examine them. You know, Christians were first called Christians at Antioch, and in Acts chapter 11, verses 27 to 30, the church at Antioch just exemplified people getting into the truth. When Paul addressed the church at Macedonia in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, uh, the exemplification was in the early church that they were supposed to get into the truth of God's word. And even in Achaia, according to Romans chapter 15, verse 23, the church in Achaia was to emphasize the truth. We always go back to those Bereans, don't we? Paul lifted the Bereans up to another level when he said the Bereans were more noble than others because they searched the scriptures to make sure that what they were hearing was the truth. And with that, as we conclude the lesson this evening, 
uh, dealing with our fellowship together and our lives together and our call to fellowship. The kingdom of God here on earth, the church, consists of those that not only love God, but those that love their brethren. Jesus emphasized, and maybe he was speaking in hyperbole, that that we are to even hate our, our own family, but love him because he is the most important one. We have our salvation in the Lord. It doesn't say that we're supposed to alienate ourselves from our personal family. It just tries to get us to understand how important our relationship with Jesus Christ is. Thus, the, the fellowship that we have when we meet together has two aspects to it. It has a vertical aspect, that being that we enjoy a relationship with God according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. Now, it has to be more than that. Because let's face it, it's a fellowship. We're fellowshipping with one another. And therefore, there is a horizontal relationship. That relationship that we have with fellow Christians. We need to enjoy that horizontal relationship and understand that it's so important because as Christians, we are on this walk together. It's why we meet together, because we have the same goals. When you go to PTA meetings, for goodness sake, you're interested in our children. That's why people go to PTA meetings. When we go to church, we're interested in going to heaven. We're interested in what our relationship with God is. And we come to understand that we are able to help one another in this horizontal relationship, as it tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. And so as we continue on in this series, we're going to look at some other aspects of our life together and the spiritual activities that nurtures us as members of the body of Christ those things that are necessary uh, to preserve our fellowship, the biblical limitations on the extent of this fellowship. But in this lesson, as we began, I wanted us to understand the importance of fellowship in the local church and the danger of self-centeredness to disrupt this fellowship. We have ways that we can connect with one another. For goodness sake, you know what? Uh, there was a time where we didn't have telephones. Uh, the early people in our country, um, the founding fathers wrote to one another. Their writings are exemplary and how they dealt with one another. And then we got other ways to communicate. We can communicate, uh, as the phone was invented, and then we had emails, and now we have the social media. We have ways to stay in touch with one another as members of the Lord Church. And we should take advantage of those ways that we interact with one another. It shouldn't just be in church. We have a Monday night uh, study at our home. Uh, here. And uh, we eat together before we study the Lord's Word. And we have such a diverse group uh, that meet together. And this group is where we're all interested in one another. Uh, because we had gone on vacation for a while, uh, we didn't have this meeting for about five weeks. And we were all almost as one saying how much we missed fellowshipping together with one another. Let's make sure that our lifestyle is such that we can be looked up to in the way that we uh, interact with our Lord and not be afraid of how others look at us, that our lives are transparent. 
I hope that this lesson was a good introduction to our life together and the importance of our fellowship. Our life together consists of those that are Christians. If you're not a Christian this evening, if you've not obeyed the Lord's plan of salvation, if you haven't heard the word and believed it, confessed Jesus as the Son of God, repented of your former life and been baptized for the remission of your sins, that is what you need to be a child of God. So this fellowship, our life together, really takes deep-rooted meaning. If you have that need, that invitation is offered to you. If uh, you need it immediately, get in touch with one of us, and we will be at your beck and call. Let's pray together as we conclude. Our Heavenly Father, help us to understand the importance of uh, being one within the church. Help us to understand that Jesus Christ gave his life up for this church, this kingdom on earth. Help us to be relevant as Christians. Help us not to be so self-centered that we would not look to the interests of others and have them in our hearts as we fellowship together because we are indeed on that same journey. Bless us on that journey, dear Heavenly Father. Help us each day to desire to get up and do your will and to serve others. Continue to be with us. Continue to bless us. Help us and comfort us when we are in need. Bless us when we are in need of your blessings. We ask this prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all. God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God.